Welcome everyone to the next Gen 4 International Forum webinar presentation. Today's presentation on overview of Canadian R&D capabilities to support advanced reactors. We'll get started in just a few minutes. Our presenter this morning is Ms. Lori Walters. Doing the introduction today is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Patricia is the chair of the Gen 4 International Forum Education and Training Working Group. She's also the National Technical Director of the Molten Salt Reactor Program for the Department of Energy in the U.S. Office of Nuclear Energy. Patricia. Thank you very much, uh, Bertha. Good morning. Good evening, everyone. Pleasure to have uh, Ms. Laurie Walters with us. She is currently the manager of the Advanced Reactor Materials and Chemistry Branch at Canadian Nuclear Laboratories where she's responsible for a team of 30 scientists, engineers, and technologists who focus on materials and corrosion testing under can-do and advanced reactor conditions, including supercritical water, high temperature gas, and molten salt environments. Lowy has been with CNL for over 28 years, providing technical and programmatic leadership on both Kandu technologies and Gen4 systems. Louis has degrees in mechanical engineering from the University of Manitoba. And during her time at CNL, she has established technical expertise in the areas of irradiation deformation and damage of in-core materials, materials performance, and in-core testing. So without any further delay, Louis, I thank you first for volunteering to give this webinar. And secondly, I cannot wait to hear your presentation. Thank you very much, Louis. Oh, thank you, Patricia. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to present today. And I'd like to just thank everybody for, uh, for your interest in uh, Canadian uh, R&D capabilities. Um, so I'd like to start uh, this presentation uh, just with a brief history of nuclear in Canada. Um, can kind of see on the box there in the bottom. I'm going to st sort of start there. Um, so starting in the 1940s, uh, we constructed the Zero Energy Experimental Pile, uh, or ZEEP, <laughs> reactor, a test reactor at Chalk River uh, in, in Ontario. Um, in 1945, the 10 megawatt, the, sorry, the 10 watt, <laughs> 10 watt ZEEP uh, achieved uh, the first self-sustained nuclear reaction outside of the United States. Uh, building partly on the experimental data obtained from ZEEP, the National Research Experimental, or NRX, um, which is a natural, it was a natural uranium heavy water moderated research reactor. It started up in 1947 and it operated for over four decades, uh, producing radioisotopes, uh, performing fuels and materials development work for the CANDU reactors and providing neutrons for physics experiments. At the time, NRX was the most powerful research reactor in the world. And eventually it was joined in uh, 1957 by the larger 200 megawatt uh, NRU research reactor. Um, the, N, uh, the McMaster uh, nuclear reactor, uh, MNR, uh, be, uh, became, first became operational in 1959, and it was the first university-based research reactor in the British Commonwealth. Since uh, NRU closure in 2018, uh, MNR is the highest flux research reactor in Canada and is currently rated to five megawatts. Canada has a track record uh, in the design, construction, license, and operation of small reactors. Uh, and in, um, at the AECL White Shell Labs in Manitoba, uh, we, we developed the uh, WR1 reactor. It was an organically cooled research reactor. And then in 1970, uh, the experimental miniature uh, 20 kilowatt slow poke reactor, which uh, is an acronym for slow, uh, safe, low power critical experiment, was assembled. Uh, eight were successfully deployed at universities and research institution, institutions. And in fact, two slow pokes are still in use in Canada and one's in use in Jamaica. Starting in 1961, AECL led the construction of 24 uh, commercial CANDU reactors in Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick. Um, there have been two major types of CANDU reactors. The original design that was intended to be used in multi-reactor installations in large plants, such as uh, Bruce and Darlington, I've kind of got this highlighted in yellow at the top, and the rationalized CANDU-6, 
in the 600 megawatt electric class that is designed to be used in single standalone units or in small multi-unit plants. CANDU 6 units were built in Quebec, uh, New Brunswick, as well as Pakistan, India, Argentina, South Korea, Romania, and China. And there are currently 19 operating CANDUs in Canada, um, and large refurbishment programs are underway to extend the operating life. And as an example, the refurbishments at Darlington and Bruce sites may result in the operation um, of their operation extended to 2050, possibly through 2064. Oops, okay, there we go. Oops, one too far. Um, the Canadian grid. Uh, is already fairly green due to electricity generation from you know these low carbon emitting sources uh, such as hydro and nuclear which contribute about 75 percent of the total electricity generation in the country but to address climate change Ca Canada has a target of net zero electricity grid by 2035 and economy wide uh, net zero by uh, 2050 in fact, the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act, which became law in 2021, enshrines in legislation Canada's commitment to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. So to meet this commitment, it has been determined that a large increase in electrification of two to three times versus the grid today is required. And part of the electri electrification would go towards decarbonizing the transportation sector, where battery electric for light duty vehicles is an option. However, for large vehicles, hydrogen fuel cells may be a good fit. And I'm going to talk about that a bit later. Success in achieving net zero will require an all options approach. Uh, necessity, necessitating the use of hybrid and integrated energy systems. It should be noted that hydro and renewables such as solar and wind do not produce industrial heat. Uh, they only produce electricity. And Canada needs energy, energy solutions, not just electric, electricity, uh, as heat demand in the winter is approximately two to three times that of electricity in northern Canada. But regardless, synergistic coupling of clean energy technologies along with a wide array of applications will be required to meet the diverse needs of industries and communities for Canada to successfully respond to the climate change emergency. And nuclear energy is a key part of that solution. Okay. Oops. Um, potential grid, uh, potential markets for nuclear power in Canada. Uh, Really, there's the grid, of course, and as I mentioned, uh, CANDUs, we have 19 of them, and they're, they provide about 15% of Canada's electricity, uh, and refurbishment is extending the life of the current fleet. But, of course, there's, uh, there's the opportunity for SMRs to enter onto the uh, Canadian energy landscape. Um, another potential application for SMRs is to support process, processes that require steam, uh, process heat, and, electri and electricity. Uh, for example, mining, uh, bitumen extraction, and steam or high temperature electrolysis to pr produce hydrogen. <clears throat> um, in, in the north, northern uh, areas of Canada, you can see on the figure there on the right, we have over 200 remote communities that rely uh, basically on diesel. Heat demand in Arctic-based remote communities can dwarf electricity demand in the winter months, and these communities typically require less than about 10 megawatts power, uh, which makes micro-reactors an option. Um, so for the three streams of SMR development in Canada, uh, the first uh, stream basically is uh, Generation 3 uh, grid scale. And uh, for this application, we have uh, four BWRX 300s, which are planned for construction at the Darlington site, uh, with, one, uh, with the first one expected to be complete in 2028, and later ones in mid-2030s. Uh, and this will be followed by four, uh, four units in Saskatchewan, with the first unit uh, being in service uh, in um, approximately 2034, mid-2030s. Mid um, but this... This fleet approach, uh, it identifies a common SMR technology, which will be quickly and efficiently deployed in multiple uh, jur jurisdictions. Um, secondly, stream two are the Gen 4 reactors, which can support various needs. Um, so these advanced small reactor designs are currently, uh, there's a couple of them that are currently being uh, developed in New Brunswick uh, through demonstrations at the Point Le Pro nuclear site. Uh, this includes the completion of the ARC-100 by 2030 and 
ARC100 is a sodium-cooled fast reactor that would generate uh, 100 megawatts electric and operate for 60 years. Uh, and this will be targeting uh, grid-scale electricity generation, industrial heat applications, and water uh, desalination. Also, Moltex, Moltex Energy's stable salt reactor waste burner uh, is expected to be operational a bit later in the 2030s in the, in the province of New Brunswick. Uh, the design incorporates elements of a molten salt reactor, and they are developing unique technologies uh, that use recycled fuel, uh, recycled waste as fuel. Um, also, Ontario Power Generation, OPG, uh, and Xergy have signed a framework agreement to produce deploying uh, the XE100 small modular reactors for industrial applications in Canada. And um, like I said, the target applications, um, they, they include process heat, desalination, potentially electricity, and cogeneration. Um, both StarCore, which is a 14 megawatt electric high temperature gas reactor, and Terrestrial Energy with their proposed 195 megawatt electric integral molten salt reactor. Um, they're, they're involved in the CNL siting demonstration project and both are in phase one of this siting process and I'm going to talk about that, uh, the siting process a little bit in, in a couple slides. Uh, stream, stream three, you can see on the right here, this involves um, micro SMRs, micro reactors. Um, these are a good option to replace diesel in remote communities and mines. And to advance this technology, a 5 megawatt gas cooled reactor project by Global First Power, OPG, and Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation is planned for the Chalk River site and it's expected to be in service in the 2030s. Uh, this this micromodular reactor is currently in phase three out of the four phase siting process at, at CNL. Um, also, a memorandum of understanding has been signed to examine the feasibility of deploying an MNR, uh, M MN micromodular reactor, sorry, at, at uh, McMaster University. Um, also looking to advance nuclear in remote communities, Bruce Power and its par partners at the Nuclear Innovation Institute have been exploring opportunities with Westinghouse Canada uh, and their E. Vinci uh, micro uh, reactor. Uh, also, Westinghouse and Saskatchewan Research, Research Council are looking to jointly develop a project to locate an E. Vinci micro reactor in the province of Saskatchewan uh, for development and testing of industrial research and energy use applications. Oops. There we go. Okay, um, so overview of this presentation. Um, so basically, uh, you know, of course, this presentation, it's, uh, it's on the capabilities within Canada to support uh, small modular reactors and, and advanced reactors. And I'm going to cover uh, some of the key uh, facilities and capabilities at the Canadian labs and universities. And then I'm going to describe uh, the application of those capabilities for the advanced reactor systems. Uh, and this, I'm going to focus on uh, advanced water cooled systems, molten salt, high temperature gas, sodium fast reactors and heat pipes. Uh, I'd also like to point out that um, this presentation is not meant to be an exhaustive summary of all R&D uh, on advanced reactors in Canada. It is, it is intended to, to basically hit a number of key points uh, within this you know, one hour presentation. Um, also, the presentation is given from the CNL point of view. Um, and although you know, I've reached out to a number of my collaborators at the universities um, within Canada, a number of institutes, and, and of course with a number of my colleagues at CNL and uh, Natural Resources Canada, undoubtedly I'm going to have missed um, some of the R&D activities. Um, and also uh, I've had to eliminate some topics in the interest of time. So, so apologies for, for um, anything that I may have missed here. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so how is Canada enabling SMRs and advanced reactors? On this slide, I've identified the actions taken by the federal and provincial governments. I'll describe three activities led by the federal government. Uh, the first one is the development of a roadmap for SMR deployment in Canada. In 2020, this roadmap was further expanded into an action plan for Canada. The roadmap identified opportunities for on and off-grid applications uh, for SMRs in Canada. 
Secondly is the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission uh, vendor design review process. This is an optional process to evaluate the technology to determine if a reactor vendor is ready for potential deployment in Canada. Uh, VDR is not a licensing discussion, it, but it is a technical conversation between the CNSC and the vendor to verify at a high level that, Canada, that Canadian nuclear regulatory requirements and expectations as well as Canadian codes and standards are, will be met. <coughs> third bullet there on the left is on funding. So the Government of Canada has multiple ways it incentivizes innovation and development in the nuclear sector and this includes funding programs and tax credits. Uh, funds available to support nuclear sector via, uh, via the uh, Canada Infrastructure Bank, um, the Strategic Innovation Fund, um, Electricity Pre-Development Program and Future Electricity Fund. Um, which um, you know supports clean energy projects, energy efficient technologies and other initiatives that will help Canada meet its climate goals and achieve a net zero emissions economy by 2050. It's important to note that in Canada provincial governments have jurisdi jurisdiction over the generation and production of electricity. So to that end, in 2021, a feasibility report on SMR development and deployment in Canada was prepared by uh, OPG. Bruce Power, New Brunswick Power, and Sask Power for the governments of Ontario, New Brunswick, and Saskatchewan. The report provides a feasibility assessment of SMR development and deployment and contains the power company's business case for SMR implementation in each of these three provinces. In 2022, a strategic plan for the development of SMRs was prepared by the governments of Ontario, Saskatchewan, New Brunswick, and Alberta. Um, these provinces, they share a collective interest in SMRs, and the report identifies five key priority areas for SMR development and deployment. These include technological, uh, technical, technological readiness, regulatory framework, economics and financing, uh, nuclear waste management, and indigenous and public engagement. Um, on this slide here, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the funding opportunities to perform R&D for SMRs and advanced reactors. So uh, AECL, or Atomic Energy of Canada, it's a crown corporation, a uh, federal crown, crown corporation, with a mandate to enable nuclear science and technology and to protect the environment by fulfilling the Government of Canada radioactive waste and decommissioning responsibilities. Uh, AECL has a central role in supporting government priorities. Uh, you can see here in the center of this little diagram. Um, in the development and deployment of advanced reactors and SMRs, including enabling uh, SMR action plan, as I mentioned earlier, and supporting Canada in meeting uh, net zero targets. Um, it's important to note that although AECL led the design and build of CANDUs in Canada uh, previously, uh, this is not the case for SMRs and advanced reactors. Uh, at, the SMRs are commercial designs that are led by, led by private vendors. And much of the advanced reactor R&D that's performed, let's say, at Canadian Nuclear Labs is supported by the uh, AECL Federal Nuclear Science and Technology Work Plan, the FNST. Okay. Uh, that R&D is intended to support the development and deployment of SMRs in Canada. So since uh, the inception of the FNST work plan in 2015, it's invested approximately $238 million uh, Canadian dollars across uh, 99 projects on uh, advanced reactor research. These projects cover a broad array of technical subjects, developing and, and maintaining capabilities and has delivered um, almost a thousand knowledge products. So these include uh, <clears throat> journal papers, conference reports, presentations, technical reports. <clears throat> Excuse me. Initial reports, uh, initial efforts under the FNST program were mandated to be as technological agnostic as possible. However, the program is pivoting towards targeted research as the Canadian SMR landscape uh, basically evolves. Um, other government funding opportunities include programs by NSERC, which uh, is an acronym for National, uh, Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, uh, Natural Resources Canada, NRCAN, and the CNSC, uh, Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. These programs enhance the capabilities of Canadian universities to undertake research related to SMRs. Uh, they increase training and help produce a new generation of nuclear scientists, engineers and policymakers. And the programs generate new knowledge to support policy and decision making related to SMRs in Canada's uh, nuclear industry, as well as to support the, uh, these, support the objectives of, the, uh, of Canada's uh, SMR action plan. 
Oops. There we go. Um, education. Um, so we have in Canada what's called University Network of Excellence in, in Nuclear Engineering, or UNITI. Uh, this is a partnership basically between uh, industry, universities, and governments <clears throat> whose objectives are to provide, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> provide a, a supply of uh, highly qualified people, HQPs, um, also to support, fund, and coordinate nuclear research and education in the universities, uh, basically to address industry needs. Um, also to enable information exchange and forums for discussion and collaboration between universities and industry and to uh, you know to create a respected pool of university-based expertise for independent stakeholder consultation so essentially the Unini partners bring together capabilities and expertise to address challenges and deliver innovation uh, to the nuclear community So in the next series of slides, I'm going to present uh, some of Canada's R&D infrastructure uh, to support SMRs. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, with CNL, uh, Canadian Nuclear Labs. Um, this is really Canada's premier nuclear science and technology organization. Our, our priorities are in the areas of health, energy, uh, climate change, environment, and safety and security. Uh, we have over 50 unique la uh, labs and facilities. Uh, several licensed nuclear facilities with over 3,000 staff. And I'm going to speak more on CNL uh, in the following slides. Uh, CANMET materials um, are a division of NRCAN, Nat Nat Natural Resources Canada. Um, and at their research facility, uh, they focus on materials, science, uh, and they have a number of unique uh, facilities as well. Their expertise lies in scientific knowledge of, of the relationships between materials, processing, microstructure, and properties. Um, at their facility in Hamilton, uh, they have pilot scale start to finish materials processing, including materials production, uh, which includes casting, rolling, forming, and enabling technologies such as joining and surface treatment. CANMET has a, a highly collaborative network supporting industry and academia, and I'm going to speak more about their capabilities throughout the presentation. Uh, Kinetrix, you can see on the right here, uh, this is an integrated life cycle management services company providing testing, inspection, certification, and engineering consultation for the electric power generation, transmission, and distribution markets uh, worldwide. Uh, they support power industry projects um, through their independent lab and uh, testing facilities. Within Canada, Kinetrix works with the can-do industry, uh, with SMR vendors, and collaboratively with academia. And I do invite you to check out their website for additional info. Okay, some of uh, CNL's unique facilities. Um, we have, we can see on the, on the left here, uh, the Advanced Nuclear Materials Research Centre, uh, which is designed to meet uh, nuclear material research needs for the next 50 years. Uh, this new facility is going to have shielded facilities to enable uh, PIE activities on structural materials and nuclear fuels, including fuel salts. So the ground has already been broken on this, um, this new center. Uh, that, that happened uh, about a year ago, and operation is expected to be uh, later this decade. Uh, we have a couple unique multi-purpose test facilities, um, including the High Temperature Fuel Channel Lab and the Thermal Hydraulics Lab. The High, the high Temperature Fuel Channel Lab, which we can see in the center, this consists of a large containment cell where, where high temperature, high pressure experiments can be performed, including the ability to study the behavior of reactor core components and heat transport systems under postulated accident scenarios. The uh, CNO Thermal Hydraulics Lab is the largest and best equipped thermal hydraulics lab in Canada. Uh, they have significant expertise in single, two-phase and multi-component flow and heat transfer. Uh, the lab operates several fully instrumented test facilities designed to accommodate a variety of equipment and this includes instrumentation for uh, the measurement of pressure, temperature, flow, velocity uh, and extensive uh, specialized equi equipment for non-intrusive and minim minimally intrusive me measurements in complex geomet geometries um, and, and it's also accompanied by uh, data acquis acquisition systems. Okay, on this slide uh, there's a few highlights on how CNL is enabling uh, SMRs and advanced reactors uh, in Canada. 
Um, so although CNL is not designing or building an SMR, we are in the process of enabling vendors to cite uh, SMRs on a CNL managed site. And at present, there's three project proponents engaged in the various stages of the citing uh, invitation process. I've kind of mentioned this earlier, and those being StarCore, a Terrestrial Energy, and uh, Global First Power's Micromodular Reactor. In the second column here, uh, with, this is the uh, a column, uh, some information on uh, the Clean Energy Demonstration Innovation and Research Initiative, or CEDAR. Okay. Um, under this program, CNL is advancing the science behind how clean energy technology, such as nuclear, can work together alongside other renewable energy sources in a hybrid energy system. Uh, such a system brings together different generation and storage technologies for application in an, in an, in an industrial subsystem uh, that requires uh, electricity or heat, for example. So in effect, this hybrid energy system becomes a single system, uh, improving the overall benefits compared to a system that depends on a single source. Uh, in the third column here, I'm showing um, this uh, techno-economic assessment tool that CNL, CNL has developed called the uh, HESO model, Hybrid Energy System Optimization, HESO. Uh, this, this model helps to gain valuable insight into possible energy transition scenarios. Uh, the HESO tool determines the best energy mix by uh, minimizing system costs or greenhouse gas emissions while achieving performance and carbon reduction uh, requirements. And in the last column here, uh, the Canadian New Nuclear Research Initiative, or scenery, this makes CNL's technical capabilities and expert knowledge available and accessible to support SMR development in Canada. The program enables joint collaborative uh, advanced reactor R&D projects between CNL and third-party proponents uh, within Canada. Okay, in these next batch of slides, I'm going to um, cover some of the key infrastructure. Um, the first one is about is on irradiation facilities. So the first one I'd like to highlight is the McMaster Nuclear uh, Reactor, MNR. Uh, it's currently operating at three megawatts, but like I mentioned earlier, it's rated to five megawatts. And this is an open pool type materials test reactor. There's 12 uh, in-core irradiation sites. Um, it can reach approximately, we've made a calculation, about one to two DPA per year. Uh, that's not validated. Uh, it's just uh, that, that was kind of an assessment that we, we did. Um, McMaster also has complementary facilities, including uh, the Center for Advanced Nuclear System, or CANS. Okay, and this is a suite of five interconnected hot cells, which enables post-radiation examine, examination of high, highly radioactive materials. Uh, they can also accommodate in-service uh, or removed, uh, uh, sir, uh, removed from service components uh, from power reactors. Um, and they have uh, in-cell workstations for receiving, machining, uh, sample prep, and testing. Um, they also have a high-level lab, which is a licensed facility that enables researchers to take a wide variety of materials and samples, which were irradiated in MNR, and, and to conduct uh, research. Okay, uh, Triumph here in the top right uh, is Canada's uh, is Canada's National Particle Accelerator Center. Uh, it's considered Canada's premier physics lab, and it's regarded as one of the world's leading subatomic physics uh, research centers. CNL has been working with Triumph to irradiate advanced reactor uh, candidate materials using a parasitic uh, target stage in the isotope uh, separator and accelerator, or ISAC, uh, test assembly. Uh, the 520 mega, uh, uh, MeV um, cyclotron produces the primary proton beams, beams uh, and the graphite holder, which you can see here in the center, uh, enables the radiation of specimens in a uh, uh, one centimeter by one centimeter uh, area. Uh, specimens are the specimens that we're currently irradiating. They're kind of small specimens. You can see they're kind of like uh, small, like sort of TEM buttons, uh, but they can be 20 centimeters long. So that the, the, uh, they'll receive damage 20 centimeters uh, parallel to the uh, to the beam. Uh, future plans are to add a heating stage to control uh, irradiation temperature. 
on the left here, we see the, um, the reactor materials testing lab, RMTL, at Queen's. Uh, this is a tandem accelerator with, with up to 8 MeV protons and 12 MeV helium uh, to introduce uh, radiation damage and transmutation products into materials. Um, the facility is used to combine damage and stress, and as well as damage and environmental effects, which I'll show in a minute. In the bottom right here, we have CNL's uh, zero energy deuterium, the Z2 reactor. Uh, this is a versatile uh, tank type, heavy water moderated, low power research reactor that first uh, achieved criticality in 1960. Historically, it's been used to develop experimental techniques and advances in in-core instrumentation and reactor physics uh, measurements for uh, heavy water reactors. Uh, we are now looking to perform measurements on mocked up SMR components, uh, such as molten salt or high temperature gas reactor subsystems. It, having a subsystem involved in the central region of the core and uh, performing measurements to, to basically to validate uh, SMR physics codes. Uh, characterization facilities. Um, McMaster, in addition to their their research reactor. They also have the uh, Canadian Centre for El Electron Microscopy, CCEM. This houses best-in-class electron and ion microscopes. Uh, CCEM serves users from academia, industry, and all over Canada as, and internationally. Um, the research published by CCEM users has steadily grown to over uh, 140 peer-reviewed uh, journal articles annually, so really quite impressive. Um, the image at the top shows the uh, shows an atom probe tomography identification of silicon segregation uh, to dislocation loops in proton irradiated stainless steel. Uh, that is, that paper was presented at the 19th uh, Environmental Day conference. Um, surface Science Western, we can see in the center here, is Canada's premier surface analysis and materials characterization facility. It's basically a research and consulting lab specializing in the analysis and characterization of surfaces and materials. Uh, the projects, they tend to be long-term and they have um, you know, extensive expertise on corrosion-related studies at, at Western. Uh, surface Science Western is licensed to handle and examine radioactive material, and they've also earned an ISO 17025-2017 standing. So, so really quite impressive as well. Um, on the left is the uh, Canadian Light Source, uh, that's in the province of Saskatchewan. Uh, it houses 22 synchrotron beam lines and an electron beam line. This is unique in Canada. Uh, the, the beam lines are optimized for select parts of the light spectrum and, and are used in a broad range of experimental techniques, including uh, spectroscopy, diffraction imaging, and imaging uh, from the macro to the nano scale. Um, data collection can be relatively rapid on the order of uh, subseconds. And on the bottom here, I've shown a capability at CNL, which enables us to prepare precision, small-scale mechanical test specimens, including those from neutron irradiated materials. Uh, this is a laser fabricated uh, dual notch, uh, mesoscale um, Zerk 2.5 niobium uh, tensile specimen shown in the first panel here. Uh, the second panel shows a uh, fib lift out to assess the laser induced damage at the, uh, at the notch root. And the third panel shows basically that there was uh, insignificant uh, laser-induced damage. It just uh, maybe like what 1.5 micrometers. Okay. Next slide. Corrosion facilities. Uh, so corrosion is studied at a number of labs and universities, but I wanted to highlight two facilities here. Uh, one at Queens, where they're using their accelerator to combine in situ irradiation. Uh, and um, corrosion, so it's proton beam and water here and specimen here in the center. And the other at the University of New Brunswick, which has the CNER, which stands for Center for Nucle Nuclear uh, Energy Research. Um, CNER specializes in water chemistry control and corrosion detection, monitoring and prevention. Uh, they have a number of high pressure, high temperature water loops, along with a full suite of surface science and analytical chemistry capabilities. Uh, and they are establishing new capabilities to include a molten salt lab for thermal and physical property measurements and corrosion assessment, as well as a new so sodium lab and test loop. Okay. Mechanical property assessment. I want to briefly highlight the facilities at CNL, CanMet Materials, and at McMaster. 
Um, at CNL, we have a long history of mechanical testing uh, to assess material degradation in support of the CANDU industry. And for the advanced reactors, we're ramping up capabilities and facilities to perform high temperature testing up to 950 degrees C in air and in uh, impure helium environments. We also have uh, expertise with uh, multi-scale testing um, to be able to test small specimens um, from irradiation programs or those extracted from in-core materials, and we perform uh, micro-testing uh, to examine effects to assess uh, across grain boundaries and hydrides, for example. So this image I've got here on the left, it's a, it's one of, it's a, a tensile specimen that was irradiated in Heifer, so it's one of their SSJ, J3s, J2s uh, specimens. Uh, we've used, the, of course, digital image correlation uh, to, to um, determine the strain here. So, and uh, this, uh, as I mentioned here, this is just, the, this is a uh, some testing that's done in the FIB and using this sort of push to pull device um, to look at uh, the effects, let's say, across a hydride or a, or a grain boundary. Um, CANMET materials, uh, they have uh, great expertise in material testing, welding, corrosion uh, facilities, including uh, what's important uh, really is stress corrosion cracking and corrosion fatigue. Uh, they also have advanced electron microscopy facilities. Um, and McMaster, they have some another great facility, um, uh, including this material property assessment lab. Uh, they are able to assess radiation uh, effects. They perform uh, testing in vacuum and low and high temperatures, um, and nano to macro and uh, standardized testing. So, so really quite impressive uh, facilities at McMaster all around. Modeling. Um, in this slide, I just want to point out some of the modeling capabilities that are being developed. Um, materials testing, and particularly irradiation, they're very costly uh, and time-consuming ex experiments. Um, however, tests are, tests are essential you know, for qualification of alloys in new applications. But you know, using validated models to elucidate the effects of material degradation, and particularly to use those models to assess long-term degradation would be a huge advantage uh, when assessing life extension of the reactors or when we are down selecting or developing candidate materials for advanced reactor applications. So independent work at the universities and CNL has been, on, been ongoing and we're now embarking on a collaborative projects under the NSERC and NRCAM programs that I mentioned earlier in an effort to uh, expedite and take advantage of broad resources. Um, in the center here I'm talking about the development of couple code suites for advanced reactors. So at CNL, we're developing multi-physics modeling capabilities for modeling non-water-cooled SMR concepts where uh, mass flow temperature and uh, uh, power parameters are exchanged between the codes. We're able to leverage the three disciplines to model heat transport systems, including CFD, subchannel, and system uh, thermal hydraulics and neutronics codes. An important point to note is that the non-water cooled systems that we're contemplating are single phase, so there's no boiling. So this that reduces the complexity, um, but however, we're lacking in data for the advanced reactors at this time. So once the ad advanced reactors or SMRs are designed and running, we'll be able to validate uh, the predictive models. But at this time, CNL is participating in code to code benchmarking exercises uh, with the UO USDOE. Um, on the right here, talking about severe accidents, um, MELCOR is a fully integrated computer code that models the progression of severe accidents with various uh, reactor geometries, fuel types, and cooling systems. MELCOR was developed at Sandia National Labs, and since uh, uh, 2018, they've been expanding uh, severe accident evaluation from LWR to the next generation of reactors. So staff at CNL are being trained to use MELCOR to model severe accidents in pebble bed HTGR systems, um, integrated PWR and BWR. Um, at the universities at Ontario Tech, for example, they've been performing work with Sandia to enhance predictive capabilities of MELCOR during a BWR uh, complete sta station blackout simulation akin to Fukushima by coupling it with Thermochemica. Uh, Thermochemica is a computational library for uh, chemical uh, thermodynamics uh, and this provides improved materials uh, chemistry predictions. Um, at CNL, we have more than 60 years of fuel, uh, nuclear fuel exper experience in support of CANDU. In a recent project, we supported the return of the uh, Royal Military College in Kingston 
uh, Ontario, uh, their, their slow poke uh, reactor to uh, operation after changing out its core. CNL performed the fuel core fabrication, which was a conversion of LAU metal to cinchable oxide powder at the uh, small uh, research reactor scale. CNL also has a long history of metallic fuel development and calling, involving fabrication, characterization, testing, and, and uh, use in research reactor, including uranium, MOX, uh, thorium, U-moly, and U-silicon. Uh, we are uh, leveraging this experience to work on advanced uh, fuels for SMRs. Um, We've also brought on board some advanced fuel fabrication methods such as par, uh, spark plasma sintering and advanced manufacturing techniques such as 3D printing of uranium and thorium filament materials. Um, in the center here, um, we're, we've seen that uh, there's been some materials that are being produced for advanced reactors such as ODS at Queen's using HIP and at CAMET materials. They produce, produced HT9 for experimental uh, sodium fast reactor fuel cladding work. Uh, CANMET also prepared a high entropy alloy using a modified induction furnace under uh, the protection of liquid argon uh, to cover, uh, to basically to stop the oxidation during melting and casting. Uh, this enables some R&D on uh, HEAs including irradiation at Queens and subsequent mechanical testing. And uh, there are a number of activities on additive manufacturing of materials from, for SMRs that are ongoing. I've shown one such uh, collaboration uh, project here that's led by the University of Alberta. It's about to, to kick off shortly. And this is on the development of high temperature corrosion resistant functionally graded materials of metal ceramic structures using uh, laser directed energy de de uh, deposition uh, and um, uh, ad advanced manufacturing solutions. Uh, safety and security. So CNL is committed, of course, to safety and security and has launched a cybersecurity research facility at the Knowledge Park in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Uh, CNL has developed a simulator of a reactor con uh, control system as a testbed for developing intrusion resistant systems, intrusion detection and remediation. Uh, this is a unique facility to safely and realistically simulate cyber attacks on nuclear industrial uh, control systems and also for testing uh, security control measures and for training uh, plant personnel in cybersecurity. Research on SMR emergency planning and uh, response optimization has been, uh, we've basically been uh, integrating our knowledge of uh, uh, reactor accidents environmental dispersion and emergency planning and and response to develop a general method uh, for determining uh, emergency planning zones uh, for any reactor type in any location including uh, northern locations. Uh, we've been working uh, on, as well on proliferation resistance and physical protection. This is mainly done um, in support of the Generation 4 International Forum, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, we're collaborating on a case study of the 3S interfaces, which is safety, security, and safeguards uh, in a generic pebble bed uh, VHTR nuclear uh, energy system design. Uh, from this study, there are a few interesting points to consider. Um, nuclear safety, security, and safeguards have strongly overlapping regi regimes. And as, uh, as such, uh, safety requirements, security considerations, and safeguard approaches uh, must be chosen in an integrated manner. Safety by design is tra traditionally well established. However, security and safeguards by design uh, is growing and developing. Okay. So... As Canada has been a can-do nation, uh, we're relative newcomers to advanced reactor systems and technologies, particularly to the non-water-cooled systems. So collaborations have been key as we tackle the R&D challenges and ramp up to support the development and deployment of SMRs and advanced reactors on the uh, Canadian energy landslide, uh, landscape. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, on this slide, I'm going to point out uh, Canada's participation in the Generation 4 International Forum and other, uh, other collaborations. So Canada participates in three of the six uh, Gen 4 uh, GIF uh, systems, including supercritical water, uh, molten salt reactors, and uh, VHTR. Uh, 
there's also some European-led uh, horizon uh, collaboration projects that are aligned with some of these uh, systems. Uh, this includes the ECC Smart, a uh, joint European-Canadian-Chinese development of small modular reactor technology, where the main objectives are to, to define uh, the design requirements for uh, supercritical water SMR technology, to develop pre-licensing studies and guidelines for the demonstration of the safety of the uh, supercritical water SMR concept, um, and the SAMO Safer project. Um, so this uh, project, it was uh, performed on the safety assessment of uh, uh, MSR systems, and I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit more in, in a few minutes. Um, Canada also participates in a number of the NEA working groups, including um, economic modeling, prolifera proliferation, resistance, and physical protection, uh, risk and safety, um, advanced manufacturing, materials engineering, and the task force on non-electric applications of, of uh, nuclear uh, nuclear heat. Um, we we participate and lead um, some uh, CRPs, and we're involved in tech talks. And there are uh, bilateral um, bilateral uh, uh, agreements in place between uh, Canada and the U.S. and Canada and the U.K., uh, as well as a number of MOUs uh, between uh, the labs, let's say CNL, and uh, with other labs and with academia. Okay, so Canada's Gen 4 national program, it officially launched in uh, 2006 and the supercritical water system was selected as it was basically uh, a natural evolution uh, from uh, CANDU technology. <clears throat> the R&D efforts, they focused on materials, chemistry and thermal hydraulics and safety for supercritical water. Um, there were large programs to engage uh, 22 universities uh, in the uh, supercritical water R&D. So the, the image here just shows all of the different universities that participated. So key contributions were made scientifically, as well as supporting the training of over 400 uh, highly qualified personnel and increasing uh, academic research capacity. From the uh, large collaboration between the labs and the universities, and that extended from 2008 to 2015, uh, the Canadian supercritical water cooled reactor concept was produced. Uh, it was formally peer reviewed by international GIF members and also by uh, Canadian stakeholders, mainly on achieving the GIF goals on economics, safety and sustainability, and proliferation resistance, as well as uh, viability of the concept. So based on the lessons learned from the conceptualization of the Canadian SCWR, it, was, it led to R&D on the uh, SCWR SMR concept, which continues today. So this slide just summarizes uh, a number of the um, R&D uh, work, uh, the R&D work that was uh, performed within Canada on supercritical water. Um, supercritical water, it, it does face the, a couple of challenges, basically in that there isn't an SMR vendor right now uh, that's uh, focusing on using supercritical water. Um, there is, you know, we've seen an, an increased interest on non-water cooled SMRs. Um, but however, Canada continues to meet its commitments uh, to the international collaboration projects, and there are opportunities for cross-cutting R&D activities, which are also aligned and beneficial for other uh, advanced water cooled systems. Um, so as the um, SCWR team within Canada, you know, it's been working together for a number of years. We built, uh, you know, highly functioning uh, teams and, and we're able to take a multidisciplinary ap approach to R&D. I'm going to talk about this a bit in the next few slides. So thermal hydraulics and safety for uh, SCWR. Um, so CNL is, you know, as CNL is the performing organization um, and continues to represent Canada on the international collaborations such as GIF, which I mentioned earlier, and the ECC SMART, the European Union-led project, uh, as I noted earlier, as well as on an IAEA CRP on advancing uh, thermal, uh, thermal hydraulic models and predictive tools for design and operation of SCWR prototypes. 
Um, some of the other activities we're doing include compiling and archiving the large amount of data that was produced in the Canadian SCWR program in a formal repository. And, and, and there still is some collaboration with universities, such as that between CNL and Carleton University in Ottawa, working together to shed light on the, uh, the effect of surface finishing or roughness on, on uh, fluid behavior. Uh, this is an important activity, as in reality, you know, all materials have some roughness. Um, as SMRs are expected to be more reliable than previous concepts, uh, it is important to understand how the effect of crud or oxide layers could affect the performance of the reactor. In materials and chemistry, the focus remains uh, in supercritical water on long-term corrosion testing of candidate cladding materials such as alloy 800H and 310S. Uh, the exposed coupons are subjected to several tests to study the morphology and thickness of the oxide layer. Uh, in addition, the, the thermal conductivity of the exposed coupons are measured. Uh, this information couples the thermal hydraulics work, uh, work with materials. Uh, CNL has also been performing a radiation test using Triumph um, on, to, on the two cladding uh, candidate materials. Uh, the compactness and uh, geometric intricacies of SMRs and uh, supercritical water designs uh, involve components that are intentionally designed to be non-homogeneous. We can see them, uh, an example here. Um, these are used to serve as corrosion or thermal barriers. The example is a structural component separating the uh, inlet flow from the outlet flow in the Canadian um, SCWR concept here at the top and, compromises, uh, and comprises a uh, corrugated core that is sandwiched by uh, two metal plates. Um, so many specimens have been made as candidate materials including foam, wire mesh, rib and 3D printed gyroid structures uh, for the corrugated core. Uh, measurements of thermal conductivity have been made for these specimens. Um, an apparatus you can see on the left here was developed to measure the thermal conductivity of coated uh, samples. Uh, in this case, it's oxidation. Um, these data are needed to complete the hydraulic resistant and convective heat trans uh, transfer uh, thermal hydraulics models. Okay, uh, moving on to molten salt uh, research. So Canada joined the uh, GIF, a molten salt reactor provisional system steering committee in 2019, and, that, and, the, and we are represented by uh, terrestrial energy. Uh, CNL has been a, an observer uh, to the provisional system steering committee since 2018, and in 2020, uh, AECL and CNL became signatories of the MOU on the uh, GIF molten salt uh, reactor system. Uh, so our research it focuses on uh, thermophysical properties, materials corrosion, and thermohydraulics. Um, so to develop Canadian expertise in areas of uh, molten salt thermophysical properties, we're, leverage, we're leveraging uh, both uh, experimental and uh, modeling uh, activities. So some of these activities include the development of uh, gaseous synthesis mo uh, methods and gaseous uh, purification techniques to produce high purity actinide chloride and fluoride salts, including plutonium bearing salts. Um, we're developing uh, Basically, we've developed, I should say, experimental protocols to measure uh, thermophysical properties. Uh, we've investigated molten salt behavior in accident conditions. Um, we've predicted molten salt properties uh, using uh, atomistic modeling. Uh, we've conducted uh, uh, MD simulation, simulations using DFT and classical interatomic potentials to determine uh, thermophysical properties of uranium-containing uh, salts. Um, we've also taken the phenomenal, phenomenological approach uh, for calculating and predicting thermodynamic, kinetic, and other properties of um, multi-component uh, systems. Uh, at the universities, uh, Ontario Tech has had a focus on uh, fission product chemistry, uh, where students have had the opportunity to purify uh, as received salts in, in an inert uh, atmospheric glove box and prepare the various salt mixtures and then uh, perform DSC, uh, DSC measurements. And that, that data is used to inform uh, you know, thermodynamic models, which can be used to predict the uh, melting temperature of molten salt mixture, solubility uh, limits, speciation in salts, et cetera. Et cetera. Um, 
multi-physics simulation. So this was this work here on the right is part of the Samer Safer project that Ontario Tech uh, participated in. Uh, they they worked to develop the new multi-physics capabilities uh, that coupled uh, CFD with computational thermodynamics, so that chemically reacting flow uh, with phase trans uh, transformations could be simulated in a molten salt reactor for reactor safety analysis. So I'm going to start these these images here. Uh, Okay, um, so this, this, these images, what they're showing is uh, simulations of fluorinating gas injected at the bottom of a cylinder containing irradiated fuel. Uh, the objective of the scenario was to recover uranium where the F2, F2 gas would fluorinate uh, liquid uh, UF4 into gaseous UF6. And, um, and this can be, uh, which, which basically, basically it would be recycled um, in, into, a subsequent, into a subsequent cycle. So I do invite you to, uh, to read the very interesting paper um, that, uh, that they did produce. Um, materials uh, in high temperature molten salt environment. Um, so we have a high temperature molten salt corrosion. Um, basically we're establishing some test capability um, with this uh, uh, natural uh, demonstration uh, circulation loop, uh, basically this uh, this loop it's going to have a, it, it has a hot leg operating at 600 degrees C and a cold leg is maintained at uh, 450 degrees C. Uh, so the molten salt corrosion loop uh, testing you know it is key uh, experimental method to study uh, thermal gradient uh, mass transport corrosion process. And it's predicted uh, basically that there's an electrochemical, electrochemical potential difference between the hot and cold region uh, that drives the corrosion process in such systems. Um, so the loop uh, testing, it, it uh, enables us to investigate the combined effects of operating parameters, uh, particularly the temperature gradient and the salt flow rate. Uh, on the corrosion process, um, and based, you know, this is unachievable in static corrosion experiments uh, in capsules or crucibles. Uh, the loop has uh, controlled salt chemistry piping as 316L stainless steel, and it's exposed to non-radioactive lithium chloride potassium chloride salt mixture. The loop uh, enables uh, salt sampling and salt chemical analysis, and corrosion assessments will be made by the dis destructive examination of the of the loop tubing upon completion of the test. Um, we're also developing and testing uh, element-specific electrochemical sensors for the chemical analysis in molten salts, and we're developing uh, an electrical conductivity probe using uh, platinum wire as electrodes, uh, testing results at uh, 550 degrees C in a eutectic mis mixture are in good agreement uh, with literature so far. Hmm. Okay. Oops. Just a second. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Just a second here. Oh, sorry. Just just one minute. Sorry. Apologies. Okay. Um, at TNL, we've built this. Uh, we built a second loop to study the uh, natural uh, circulation uh, phenomena in chloride and fluoride-based molten salt mixtures, and you know to investigate uh, instrumentation uh, that is compatible with molten salts for experimental um, measurements. So uh, this. This design is a simplification of a single loop in the direct reactor auxiliary cooling system. Um, the loop is uh, two meters tall. It operates at 550 degrees C. Um, it's, uh, it's made of stainless steel 316, and it's instrumented with fiber optic sensors, um, uh, also uh, capacitance sensors, uh, thermocouples, and ultrasonic uh, flow sensors. Uh, the parameters of interest from this um, from this uh, passive uh, loop, uh, it's really to to look at the eff effectiveness of the instrumentation, uh, to look at changes in geometry due to aging, and and it's going to provide us with data for benchmarking models, uh, including CFD and uh, system code simulations. Okay, oops. 
Okay, uh, VHTR. Oops, went too far here. VHTR. Uh, Canada originally joined uh, the GIF, the Generation 4 International Forum VHTR project, uh, under two project arrangements, and that was materials and hydrogen, and that was going back to 2006. Um, in 2012, we withdrew from the materials project arrangement, but remained in the hydrogen project arrangement. Um, in 2022, we rejoined the P materials uh, project arrangement, and we're contributing to the graphite and metal design, metals design methods work packages. Okay, so participating in the GIF VHTR enables us to develop some uh, experience working with graphite. Uh, and we're contributing to the qualification uh, of uh, existing grades of graphite. So we're looking at density, coefficient of thermal expansion, thermal conductivity measurements on oxide samples with various weight loss. This will determine the effect of acute oxidation during air ingress scenarios on graphite thermal properties. And we're looking at three grades of graphite, ranging, ranging from the fine grain, um, IG110, to the medium grain uh, size uh, graphites. Okay, CNL and CANMET are collaborating on high temperature materials assessment, uh, mainly to assess uh, welding performance on heat exchanger alloy with a focus on creep resistance and uh, structural uh, stability. So we've eval evaluated the mi microstructural stability and deformation mechanisms for alloy 800H uh, with Haynes uh, 230 filler material. You can see this on the left here. So at 760 degrees C, the specimen ruptured at the base metal section of the gauge length. Um, and this was as a result of localized, uh, localized necking and uh, deformation uh, as a result of a uh, uh, dislocation uh, creep mechanism. You can see the fusion zone here in the center. Um, at 950 degrees C, uh, the specimen ruptured at the heat affected zone uh, just adjacent to the fusion zone here. Uh, and this was as a result of significant grain growth and carbide coarsening. You can see we've got this uh, image here. Um, so at CNL, we're continuing to grow our high temperature materials testing capabilities by commissioning a high temperature creep tester with an environmental cha chamber for testing in, uh, in, in helium environments. And we're expanding to include uh, electromechanical creep testing uh, for creep crack, creep crack growth tests. Corrosion is a concern uh, both for the HTGR core graphite and metallic uh, components. Um, helium, it's an inert, a gas, uh, but in impurities, you know, they may be in, in, uh, unintentional or intentional additives, uh, you know, to limit graphite oxidation. Uh, so the resulting he helium composition uh, with small amounts of impurities, uh, it can have implications uh, for the metallic components resulting in oxidation, carburization, decarburization, uh, depending on the impurity levels and temperature. And for example, carburization can embrittle structural uh, alloys while decarburization um, can uh, uh, of selected uh, selective oxidation of uh, chromium, aluminum, or, or titanium can dissolve uh, strengthening phases, uh, uh, thereby impacting it'll impact the creep. Okay, um, at CNL we're testing at 760 degrees C um, with uh, relative you know pure um, helium gas and also you know gas mixtures. Um, corrosion studies at Queens in, uh, can include uh, irradiated specimens. High temperature, um, high temperature gas reactor safety. Um, so in certain uh, HTGR concepts, decay heat removal is driven by thermal radiation and conduction mechanisms within the reactor vessel or containment, and natural circulation occurs on the outside of the vessel. So what we're seeing here is a bell jar apparatus, uh, but what you don't see is the uh, the covering sort of uh, glass, um, which would be uh, painted black on the inside. So and this uh, this will be used to to measure emissivity at high temperatures. Oops. Go back to where it was. It, this, this is going to be used to measure emissivity um, in the range of uh, 1400 to 1600 uh, degrees C, and we're setting up to commission with graphite specimens. What we see on the right here is uh, air ingress experiment experiments. Uh, the apparatus is being designed to study the onset of natural circulation of air through the core region in a postulated HTGR uh, uh, primary circuit break. 
uh, Gothic simulations have shown relatively slow mixing before rapid onset of natural circulation. Uh, the facility enables an improved understanding of phenomena critical to the uh, mechanistic source, source term analysis. Uh, Trizo research. Okay, so at CNL, we're undertaking efforts to develop modeling and experimental uh, capabilities to characterize and, and study the performance of triso based fuel. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, uh, triso fuels are spherical layered composites comprising of a fuel kernel, uh, which is encapsulated within layers of low density carbon buffer, pyrolytic graphite, and silicon carbide. Okay. The silicon carbide layer acts as a main barrier to fission product release and contributes to the mechanical integrity of the particle at elevated temperatures and under the effect of radiation. Um, so a greater understanding of silicon carbide grain size, its distribution and nature of grain boundaries are essential to evaluate its mechanical performance at reactor operating conditions. Uh, work is ongoing to determine room and elevated temperature mechanical properties such as elastic modulus and harness behavior of silicon carbide and the interfaces. Uh, in addition, we've been irradiating, irradiating surrogate particles to different DPA levels at Triumph. You can see that here in the bottom uh, to examine radiation-induced uh, defects and mechanical properties. Uh, X-ray uh, computed tomography has been used to non-destructively image as fabricated surrogate, surrogate uh, triso-particles and compacts. Uh, CNL staff recently used the Canadian light, so light source synchrotron-based uh, XCT and XRD uh, to characterize triso-particles uh, to perform high-resolution uh, image analysis of, co of the coded layers, uh, basically with a focus to identify the defects and anomalies in, uh, in those layers and at the interfaces. Um, We've also developed a test facility here in the top right for impact fretting wear testing in a helium environment at 700 degrees C. The facility can reproduce realistic component interfaces and reproduce uh, in, ser in service uh, vibration conditions, including fretting wear testing on the surface of the pellets. And on the bottom here, We've, uh, we've got some activity on SPS uh, being used to assess whether it's viable method to fabricate right cylinder compacts uh, containing uh, the surrogate triso particles. At, oops, next slide. Uh, at, um, at the universities at Ontario Tech, uh, they're addressing the knowledge gap related to the solubility of rare earths in trisographite layers. Um, in a collaboration with the University of uh, Texas, San Antonio and Oak Ridge, um, samples are implanted with rare earth fission products in graphite and, and then DSC measurements were performed. I, I believe, I understand that this was a uh, MSC thesis. Um, fuel work, uh, fuel performance work using bison was performed to simulate palladium uh, fusion product release in uh, triso fuel um, as well. Next slide. Oops, okay, here we go. Um, mo oops, modeling. Let's go to the modeling slide. Yep, there we go. Um, so for materials modeling, uh, we looked at the effect of radiation damage on radiation-induced segregation at grain boundaries uh, for L800H. Uh, the grain boundary character distribution was determined using EBSD and proton radiation defects were identified using TEM. Um, the experimentally observed grain boundaries were uh, recreated in um, at atomistic uh, simulations uh, to further study their, their atomistic structure. Uh, also the grain boundary energies and local element uh, concentration. Uh, the effects of radiation-induced de defects on the redistribution of alloying elements at various grain boundaries uh, were also uh, investigated. In the uh, middle column here, um, we have some work that we're performing uh, in collaboration with the uh, GIF uh, VHTR Computational Methods Validation and Benchmark Program. Um, this work, it's influenced by a couple considerations, a couple key considerations. The first being design maturation uh, of the um, advanced reactor concepts. It's basically at a varied stage, you know, so, so the transient scenarios, they're not yet clear. Um, coolant and moderator properties are sometimes proprietary to the SMR vendor and component details and plant layouts are, are evolving and being developed. Um, 
there's also limited experimental facilities available to provide integral and separate effect tests. You know, this is challenging for codes that use empirically de derived uh, parameters, such as heat transfer correlations, loss factors, um, and, um, and this impedes the development of mechanistic models to capture um, associated uh, flow physics. So, so the work that we're doing, it consists of pre-PERTs or pre, you know, the phenomena Phenomenon Identification Ranking Table, prepared. Um, they're being developed for standalone and coupled analysis for normal and transient scenarios for gas-cooled reactors, including three streams of modeling uh, with C CFD, system, uh, thermal hydraulics, and, and new neutronics, as shown in the image here. And we're developing best practice guidelines for setting up uh, CFD models using commercial codes based on uh, internal and international benchmarking, um, benchmarking efforts. Uh, fuel modeling. So re real uh, real triazole particles, they may deviate from um, sort of an ideal spherically concentric uh, layer geometry. The non-ideal geometry may localize stress in regions of high curvature, increasing peak stress uh, compared to perfectly spherical particles. Uh, the higher peak stress may increase the probability of initiating layer uh, delamination or cracking. So prediction, predictions of mechanical failure, failure probability must account for the, the degree, frequency, and interaction of the aspherical features on peak stress. Uh, so to that end, um, thermomechanical modeling has been, has been developed and is ongoing using the Moose and Bison code from Idaho National Lab. Um, we also have a collaboration that's, that's just about to kick off, and it's being led by University of Western Ontario. Uh, to understand the micro mechanics of deformation and fracture of surrogate triza particles, uh, to better understand the effects of uh, thermal uh, thermal mechanical loads on the safety and integrity of uh, triza fuels, uh, this is going to include both experiments to characterize the mechanical properties of triza layers as a function of temp temperature and radiation damage, and to develop a microstructural a microstructure informed numerical model for simulating the dimension uh, changes of the triza layers. And hydrogen. Um, so hydrogen is an environmentally friendly uh, carry, energy carrier. Um, you know, unlike electricity, it can be stored in large uh, quantities. Um, you know, it can be inverted, it can be converted into electricity in fuel cells uh, with only you know heat and water as byproducts. Um, and it can be used for the decarbonization uh, of multiple of uh, multiple uh, sectors such as long haul transport, chemical industry, steel, and iron production. Um, so the copper chlorine cycle, this is a four-step thermochemical cycle for the production of hydrogen. Uh, copper chlorine is a hybrid process, it employs both thermal, chemical, and electrolysis steps. Um, it has a maximum temperature requirement of uh, 530 uh, C. Uh, so demonstration of the technical viability of copper chlorine cycle at a lab scale has been done at CNL. Also, uh, we have, at CNL, we've established materials fabrication and testing capabilities for high temperature steam and CO2 uh, electrolysis process. Um, this high temperature steam uh, CO2 co-electrolysis process leads to syngas and hydrogen production. So nuclear energy can be capitalized on both you know, electricity and heat to provide a clean and reliable source of hydrogen through various processes. Uh, some methods of producing hydrogen need electricity, uh, some uh, such as you know, uh, traditional electrolysis, others like the thermochemical cycles uh, could simply uh, need, process, uh, need process heat, okay? uh, which can be given at you know, high temperatures from, uh, from you know, the advanced reactors, while hybrid methods uh, such as high temperature steam electrolysis um, they may need both heat and electricity. Okay, so we have a little bit of work. I shouldn't say a little bit of work, but um, in, compar in comparison to maybe some of the other systems on uh, sodium fast reactors. Um, next slide. So in uh, in uh, sodium fast reactor me metallic fuel, uh, a common failure mode is the uh, fuel clad uh, chemical interaction. Um, so at uh, at Ontario Tech, they've done some thermodynamic modeling of a radiated fuel to uh, to you know to interpret some PIE experiments that were done on EBR2 2 fuel performed at Idaho National Lab. Um, on the right here, we can see there's some chemistry control uh, control during long-term storage of um, of used fuel. So um, 
what they're doing here is um, is considering you know the deep geological repository, uh, the DGR. It's a good way to keep uh, nuclear uh, waste safe by burying it uh, in, in dry rock. Uh, for SFR uh, used fuel storage, the sodium bond between metallic fuel and fuel cladding material can react if exposed to water during uh, DGR flooding. So CNER and CANMIT materials are working collaboratively to ultimately quantify uh, reaction products and their effect and their effects on uh, fuel cladding when water interacts with sodium in quantities representative of those found inside the fuel cladding. Um, areas of focus for metallic fuel development. Uh, this includes uh, safety as aspects of handling sodium during the fuel fabrication process and disposition of spent fuel. Waste minimization and energy efficiency are also uh, major considerations. Um, in the middle column here, we see that Ontario Tech has been involved in a collaboration to assess metallic fuel performance. Uh, this work simulated um, uh, fuel performance by coupling bison and thermochemica, where thermochemica provides, again, the uh, chemical uh, potential gradients to drive uh, uh, zirconium solid state diffusion. Uh, what's unique here is that the effects of irradiation, you know, the fission pr product chemistry, contributes to solid state diffusion. And the zirconium bathtub pro profile here, um, it's, uh, it's often seen experimentally but not fully understood. Um, CNL has done a little bit of work on, um, uh, on uh, spent fuel management. So, um, uh, a, uh, a 3D serpent uh, model of, uh, of a generic uh, 100 megawatt electric class SFR was developed using publicly available data from uh, prototypes such as EBR2, the fast flux uh, test facility, and the advanced burner test reactor prism and others. Uh, so burn-up calculations indicated that the core lifetime of this uh, generic SFR SMR uh, before refueling could be as long as 29 years. Uh, and the uranium and plutonium found in spent fuel could be very attractive for recycling to make uh, new fuel for subsequent uh, uh, SFR, SMR cores uh, or for other types of reactors. So really interesting work, absolutely. Uh, and my final topic is, um, is on uh, heat, pipe, uh, heat pipe research. Okay, so we've been working with uh, single alkali metal heat pipes tested up to 750 degrees C for sodium heat pipes and 625 for potassium heat pipes. Um, we've also looked at an array of five sodium heat pipes uh, in steel. A monolith was constructed and instrumented to study off-design conditions such as failure uh, of one or two of the heat pipes. Um, so startup and shutdown of the heat pipe is, is kind of the challenging part uh, of the experiment. Um, what we're seeing here on the left is uh, some preliminary results. Um, what we see is the power uh, to the heater was initially cycled, uh, and, and although the power was cut off here, uh, the temperatures kept cycling for a while. So the, these will correspond to the thermocouples here. Uh, the experiments providing data for heat pipe module development in, um, in uh, like, the uh, thermal um, in the code such as Ariant, uh, as well as being used in code and model benchmarking uh, exercises. Okay, so in summary, um, so in this presentation I've spoken about some of the nuclear history in Canada and the need to bring SMRs and advanced reactors onto the Canadian energy landscape as part of the solution to meet uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, targets. Uh, Canada is primarily a can-do nation, and as we move to support the development and deployment of SMRs and advanced reactors within Canada, we consider participation in collaborations to be essential as we ramp up uh, our R&D capabilities to understand the needs and gaps for the various reactor designs and systems. Um, investment is key. Uh, and I've spoken about the various government funding opportunities to support development of highly, highly qualified people and R&D facilities and capabilities at the labs, research institutes and universities within Canada. Um, in the recent past, you know, this collaborative approach uh, resulted in the significant achievement of the development of a validated Canadian SCWR concept. And going forward, uh, we will again focus resources and you know, work collaboratively to support advances in nuclear to, to be able to effectively address uh, climate change emergency. I would like to thank uh, all of the people at the various universities um, 
as well as Natural Resources Canada, ACL, and with it, my colleagues at CNL for providing me with uh, um, you know, uh, pieces of um, uh, some of their topics of, on their research. I greatly appreciate, and I uh, working with all of you, I, I think there's a lot of fantastic working work going on. So um, yeah, it was my pleasure to be able to uh, uh, present uh, information on all of your wonderful work um, during this past hour or so. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions. Can I go to the last slide? Thank you, Lori. Thank you very much for sharing all of that information. Um, it's great to see so much work going on in Canada. Before we get to the questions, there have been some that have already been written in. If you have questions, go ahead and type those into the questions pane now. Um, we'll take a quick look at the upcoming webinar presentations that we have scheduled. In April, multi-physics depletion and chemical analyses of molten salt reactors. In May, it's a joint GIF IAEA webinar presentation. It'll be a panel discussion on regulatory activities and support of SMRs and advanced reactor systems. And in June, directed energy deposition process of corrosion resistant coating for lead business, excuse me, lead bismuth eutectic environment. So we do have a few questions that came in um, already during the presentation. Give me just one minute. I'm going to make sure that you can read the, the questions as well, Lori. Hang on, I'm going to make you. An organizer, so you should see the questions pane. The first question is, can Canada license and build, then operate any other reactor type other than can do? Um, yeah, so um, so my, my answer to that is, uh, is of course, uh, but uh, I just wanted to just sort of to clarify that, you know, AECL and CNL are not are not sort of in the business of building uh, building reactors, designing or building reactors, but um, but any vendor uh, that 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 has a um, that has a design uh, go they you know going through working with the Canadian um, uh, CNSC uh, absolutely these can be design these can be licensed and built and operated within Canada. Yeah. Thank you. Um. For a country that for years concentrated on one technology can do, why is Canada considering such a wide spectrum of technologies? Mm -hmm. Canada hasn't given up on can do. So no, so no, we've we've certainly not given up on can do. Um, as I mentioned, we are we are refurbishing a number of the can do's. You know, uh, sort of like for a, uh, a second lifetime, so to speak. Okay, um, so those will continue to to operate. Um, I, I I am aware of a um, of a, a large uh, sort of um, design that's being contemplated uh, within Canada. Um, and why are we considering a wide range of technologies? So, so the for the Gen 4 systems, the advanced reactor systems. Um, as, so, as I mentioned, you know, CNL and AECL, we're not we're not we're not designing or building. But what we are doing is uh, is we are um, uh, we're looking to to uh, you know let's say to to have the advanced reactors on the uh, Canadian uh, energy landscape, and and these are these are. Uh, private vendors, they're you know commercial uh, private vendors. So um, so they they can of course they can uh, the, let's say a vendor for example they they have their own design. Um, they they do their R and D. They can come to a place like CNL or any other um, you know organization uh, to support their R and D, um, and then they can make their submission to uh, to the CNSC um, you know for licensing. So it's it's uh, it's it's not that you know we're looking at um, a variety of uh, you know we're uh, having a variety of uh, let's say SMRs within Canada to meet the various needs that that we have so um and we've you know we're we're you know kind of like sort of a we're a, fr a friendly place you know for for these to to base uh, for the various designs vendors to come and uh, you know to establish 
you know, because we have a wide range of needs. We have areas that have a high population and then areas with very little population, um, you know, that, that of course still need, still need the, uh, the power. And we have, of course, remote mines um, and industry. So, so I'd say it's, uh, there's, there's many opportunities for advanced reactors for the various types, okay? Uh, Canada has definitely not given up on CANDUs. CANDUs can will remain part of the uh, energy landscape for, uh, for many decades to come. Yeah, Thank I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Are you aware of any research into standardization of nuclear modules, interfaces, and coupling to non-nuclear systems? For example, desalinization, hydrogen production, et cetera regarding the fuel salt synthesis? Uh, standardization, are you aware of research into standardization? Um, so, so as I mentioned, you know, we do have like the cedar, uh, the cedar activity. I, I'm not aware, I'm not, a, I'm not um, aware of the sort of standardization on that. So, uh, so this, I see this, this uh, came from, from Andy, Andy, uh, the message came from Andy. Andy, if you, if you would like to please, you know, reach, uh, reach, reach out to me. Um, you know, you can send me an email and I can certainly follow up with that. Uh, we, we do have experts here at CNL and, um, you know, they, they're probably, uh, they can probably answer that question really quickly. Sorry, I, 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 I'm not aware of that, of that uh, research into the standardization. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, and just, just as a reminder, your email information is on the Meet the Presenter a slide that was presented um, early in this presentation. Uh, so everyone should have a copy of that. If, yeah. if there's any difficulty in locating it, you can always send me an email and I'll be sure to forward it to Lori as well. Um, regarding the fuel of salt synthesis, are you, are, are you developing new fuel synthesis technologies or using known chlorinization, fluorinization methods? Do you have any plans to scale up these synthesis techniques to produce larger quantities, you know, like kilogram scale? Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, same thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to defer that first part of that question. Uh, so that that came from Rodolfo. So so please please send me an email, and they might, I mean my colleagues can can answer that immediately for you. Yeah, plans to scale up for sure. You know we're gonna need we're gonna need large scale, um, and that you know that would be that's 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 uh, a goal that uh, you know that we we're gonna you know work towards absolutely going to the kilogram scale because you know it will be need for experiments. And um, it'd be great to be uh, to have that on site. So, so Rodolfo, same thing. Please, please just reach back to me, and I can e we can easily answer that question. My team, my team is probably listening listening to me now and saying, oh, you know, they, they know exactly the answer. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Great, thank you, um, Lori. Which are your priority areas of R and D for HTGRs? Yeah. So, um, so I'm I'm. Uh, my team in my branch, uh, for example, uh, we we're focused on high temperature materials testing. Um, so we've you know we've ramped up the capabilities. You know we had you know many years of testing at uh, you know creep testing, um, fatigue testing. Uh, you know at uh, you know you know at the 300 degrees C. But you know ramping up now to go up to the you know to the almost to a thousand like to 950 degrees C. So that's a key area that that we're looking at. Um, my team also looks at, you know, corrosion. Um, so I've mentioned that as well. Um, uh, we do have a very large uh, uh, program on, on triso, triso fuels. So that's, um, that's, uh, that's, that's a major focus in, the, in my directorate. Um, it's performed in another branch, but uh, you know a number of my staff. We work collaboratively across, of course, the branches, and uh, they're participating in that. So a lot of work on triso. Um, we also mentioned, you know, kind of that uh, fretting where uh, program where, where you know that was again another area that was basically pivoted from a current fleet sort of technology, pivoting towards supporting the advanced fleet. Now, yeah. thank you. Can you briefly explain the difference between CNL and Chalk River National Laboratory missions? Oh yeah, sure. Uh, okay, so Canadian Nuclear Labs um, and uh, and Chalk River. So Chalk River is the uh, Chalk River is the location. It's it's uh, it's it's a site here in Ontario. 
Um, we're about two hours, uh, two hours away from the national capital, Ottawa. Um, so uh, Canadian Nuclear Labs, um, CNL, it's, uh, it, has a, it has a few sites. Uh, Chalk River, it, it, you know, manages a few sites. Chalk River is the largest one. Uh, we do have sites in, uh, in um, uh, White Shell as well and other loc other locations, but uh, Chalk River is the largest site, so CNL manages the site, yeah. Thank you. Um, I was gonna say, we're running out of time, so let's see if we can um, get some of these that maybe are a little different. Considering the NWMO's active consent-based approach to citing a repository, is a similar approach being utilized to citing new reactors in Canada, especially for greenfield sites? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so this comes from Sven. Uh, so, Sven. So, yeah. Unfortunately, I, I I'm, I'm not going to be able to answer that question uh, for you. Um, but you know, like I said, please please feel free to reach out to me. I'll uh, I'll certainly uh, I can certainly uh, I put you in touch with with people who uh, who will be able to answer that. Yeah. So um, I, there, someone mentioned slide eleven. On slide eleven, you write Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission CNSC pre licensing yeah. vendor design review of twelve SMRs. Yeah. Did they take into account the TRL in order to prioritize the evalu evaluations? Hmm. I'm not sure if they. I'm not sure if they if they did uh, any prioritization. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about their process in that. Um, but uh, but I mean they do have you know and even some of these the steps that they were taking they're they're online and we can see where they um, the the various steps and uh, so so is it prioritizing based on TRL? Yeah, I, I I don't I don't really I don't really know if they did that. I I would say I you know I mean they're gonna they're gonna be able to sort of um, um, you know provide feedback. The more information that that was there to provide feedback on 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 if they're gonna be able to meet you know the uh, you know the licensing requirements. But I don't know if they really if they really did take into account um, uh, a, a, you know the TRL. Yeah. Um, Lori, do you see of the of the questions that are still left in that list? Do you see some that you would prefer to address, and others that we may need to just move into the parking lot, given the the fact that we are at um, 90 minutes already? Do you um, want do you want to see if there's something there that you want to take maybe the last question? Um. Well, I was gonna, uh, you know, can do. I'll, I'll go back to can do. Maybe that's not the best for the last question because this was a, a presentation on advanced reactors. But, but you know, operating life of the can do's. Um, you know, what will what will limit the operating? Well, you know, because we're doing a refurbishment now. Let's say of the core. You know, the fuel channels. So you know, fuel channels. Of course, the pressure tubes they creep. So so you know, these have all been re replaced. You know, there there are of course certain components that that can't be re replaced. For example, you know, the uh, the um, the vessel, the calandria vessel. So you know, that's you know, and that's the same with that's LWRs. I, I think they can't replace the, pre the pressure vessel. But in Candus, we it's it's just a calandria. It's a vessel. Uh, it's not a pressure retaining but still it's large so so you know that 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 would be challenging um you know if there has to be repairs and you know it, you know because of you know potential uh, helium content content let's say transmutation products like in you know in radiated stainless steel but but you know there is r d that's going on you know for all of that i don't know i don't know if there's uh yeah i mean is there a limit on the operating life of can do i don't know about that i i i, I would like to think I would like to think that we can overcome those challenges and we can keep those we can keep them running for for you know like I said they're going into their sort of second lifetime like why not a third lifetime <laughs> um, qualification of HT materials extensive testing have you considered use of AI and probably yeah so so that last question there by by Nawal um, so there there are some uh, AI uh, and probabilistic uh, methods uh, that are ongoing absolutely. Um, in some of our, um, you know, our, some of our con computational techniques uh, programs. So for sure, that's um, 
it it is a it is a, a way of sort of uh, looking at and 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 making sure we're focused on the uh, you know the key the key topics of course yeah yeah but any of the presenters uh, or sorry any of the questions here please please uh, you know if you or anything pops up please feel free to to email me and I'll certainly put you in contact with uh, with the uh, a person who can answer the question a little more uh, uh, in, uh, intelligently than I <laughs> than I can. Yeah. Oh, no. You did wonderfully. Thank you so much again for sharing your time and uh, presenting all this excellent information. And thank you to the audience members um, for sticking around for so long uh, to, to get your questions answered and to participate in this webinar presentation. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to see the number of people who will participate in the webinars, um, but it's always also very interesting to see how many questions we get and the interest in a particular topic and the people who are um, dedicated enough and interested enough to have the time availability to, to stick around. We still have over 70 people. Um, and that's, so we, we really thank you and appreciate your participation. Patricia, do you have any um, closing thoughts? Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you again, Louis. It was a very comprehensive uh, presentation. Uh, for everyone who have questions, and we could not answer because of the timing. The email of Laurie is laurie.walters at cnl.ca. It's on slide five, meet the presenter. Again, thank you so much, Laurie. Thank you to everyone for following the webinars. And uh, we see you in a month uh, on the, I think, 17th of, uh, of April uh, with the Molten Source Reactor presentation. So thank you, everyone. Thank you again, uh, Bertha, for everything. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye.